Hello, my name is Beth Scott. I am the PI of uh, EcoWind program Pelagio. And as you can see by this slide, there are a lot of academic and project partners. A better way to view them is to look at them like this and see all these incredible people that are making this project a success uh, that it is. Now, EcoWind program has these three big areas of science and the Pelagio project has three big work packages that map onto those. First of all, our work package one uh, looks at the physical effects of offshore wind farms. And we're doing this by looking at the scale locally, regionally, and shelf wide. And we're also putting it into the context of climate change. In work package two, we are looking at predator to prey. We're trying to understand how fish availability changes and how that can provide foraging opportunities to top predators like seabirds. And then in work package three, we're looking at the ecosystem level effects by using ecosystem models that can predict the cumulative effects on all populations. And then we're produ producing tools for assessing these trade-offs to inform policy. Now in work package one, we did a lot of field work this last year and we were highly successful. We did most of our work out at Sea Green. And as you can see, our intrepid team was out there. Our red circles are us going around in circles on our surveys. And the green and the purple are the fact that we put gliders out uh, out there for months that I'll come back to in a second. But we also put uh, three different moorings in. So our mooring systems all were at least 500 meters and then out to several kilometers. But we were quite lucky that we could take the one mooring that has both this physics and fish on it and move it just 50 meters away from one of the turbines. Now, as I said, the gliders were out from April to August, and so luckily or unluckily, we caught the heat wave that was out there where things were at least four degrees above normal. So what happened is when you look at these temperature profiles, instead of a normal one, the big top of the um, thermos, thermocline was very warmed up and it became very stratified, and therefore, actually, it was very difficult to mix things like oxygen down. But the only good thing is it looks like the bottom temperatures did not warm up that much. What we're also doing in work package one is a lot of modeling. And we're using these 3D oceanographic models, the FVCOM models. We can model out this whole area. What I'm going to show you here is the scale at which we are modeling where the scale is so small that actually we can fit one turbine in each of the nodes. What we're trying to do is actually look at what happens both above the water when we extract the energy out of the air and also then below the water when water is hitting around the, the uh, pole and therefore there's changes to vertical mixing and also to drag. So back then to work package two, uh, while we were out going around in circles um, of picking up the data, we were then using the acoustics on board so we could look down and this is then looking at all surveys going in circles at and stopping for CTDs. But the bottom there, what you've got is all the fish schools and in, in color and in black are the, the actual schools to make that you be able to see where they are. And then above that, you've got circles that are representing uh, numbers of seabirds that we've seen. Then for the upward facing moorings uh, that we're using to look for fish, what you see here is over a series of days, you can see the actual diel uh, migration that you'd expect uh, out in our oceans. Uh, within Work Package 2, we also are working with RSPB and their seabird tagging program, which was actually, even despite uh, bird flu, was quite successful. And these are these new higher spatial uh, resolution tags. So we really can start to look at foraging behaviors and also things like the flight height with gannets. And this is just showing some of, some of the data that's been collected this summer. The reason we're doing all this is that uh, one of the things we're trying to ask is can we go from Fish to, um, physics to fish and explain what fish are doing uh, with some of the physical things we're looking at and the changes. And therefore, we can go from birds to fish. And possibly then we can cut out the fish and just go physics to seabirds if we can, where we're going to validate uh, these relationships. We hope then this will also reduce a lot of the uncertainty uh, we have now and we can really predict forward with climate change. Within our uh, Bayesian ecosystem modeling approach then, what I'm showing you here is just one of the outputs we have taking an area uh, wider for the fourth area. 
um, where we've been able to use 33 years of data uh, to look at predictions then with these ecosystem models um, over time and see which predictors, we're calling them, which, which variables actually allow us to look at what the trends are in these animals. And things have come out for cod like mixed layer depth and the maximum amount of chlorophyll A, and then also the landings of dismersal fish. So there's no population dynamics in there at all. Those three things are what's actually getting us a good trend in cod recruitment. So we're taking those kinds of models to be able to look at scenarios of what happens when we displace fisheries and really change the amount of landings and catch that's going on in there in these areas. And we've also put out a whole bunch, uh, put out a questionnaire so that we can ask fishermen themselves what they think of all this. So that's this on your screen right now. Um, that is shutting down very soon, but we've had quite a few good responses. Um, and it's been really interesting to hear what the fishing industry has to say. <clears throat> then we're taking all of this and putting it into this higher level of ecosystem services and natural capital approaches. So we can look at the trade-offs between fishing, energy, and biodiversity. And as I say, we're doing that all together with all of this large uh, modeling approaches. So that was us in a nutshell. Um, hopefully we're just about to go out to our second field season. But I look forward to any questions. Hello everyone, my name is Katrin van Landingen. Have a look at the map on the left hand side. That is the Eastern Irish Sea and you can see lots of offshore infrastructure there. Lots of wind farms already in place and lots being planned. And on the right hand side at the bottom you see a habitat uh, assemblage cluster map and that will tell you that there are lots of different benthic habitats across this area. And so that brings us to two main questions, really. When the seabed hosts infrastructure, but also most of the UK's benthic habitats, what will be the effect of the seabed when there's lots of wind farms uh, coming online, but when there's also climate change? And what will be the effect on the wider ecosystem and the seabirds as well? From those questions, the EcoWind Accelerate project was born. And what we will do essentially is look at different scenarios of climate change, different scenarios of wind farm expansion, and we will look at the effects on the seabed mobility, the effects on the seabed habitats that depend on that mobility, the effects on the fish that depend on the habitats and that are our key prey to the seabirds. So what will be the effects on them? We are working at three different scales, really. The Eastern Irish Sea is our case study, as I've explained in the first slide. And so the high resolution modeling is happening there. But the environmental drivers are taken from UK shelf wide models. Whilst the physical properties of the flow around the monopile, that is taken from the small scale physical modeling that we do at HR Wallingford and their very large flume facilities. So we're getting those processes just right. Now, the observational campaign that we do, that is also in the Eastern Irish Sea, uh, but we're also considering again at that smaller scale, the monopile scale, what is growing on the monopile itself and on the rock armor. And that observational campaign, that is co-registering the habitats, the fish, the birds, and we are there for getting that relationship between the seabed, the habitats, the prey, and the birds just right, so we can then go and upscale that again for sensitivity analysis at UK shelf scale once again. And when you do all that modeling, we need to quantify the variance. And again, we do that at three different scales. At the single point scale, uh, that's the monopile scale, we deploy several seabed landers in the wake of a monopile to generate the ideal data set from which we can do digital twinning, from which we can simulate the error propagation. Because when we go at the scale of the offshore wind farm, we are coarsening the resolutions of the data sets. And we are quantifying what the impact will be when we try and predict the best stresses from that. And in the end, that will allow us to generate confidence maps to accompany our model outputs for seabed stresses, but also for the habitats. Now, in the end, there will be a tool for end users to enter their own data resolutions and to quantify the uncertainties themselves. And now I will quickly take you through two recent research highlights from the project. 
So as I mentioned before, we were setting everything in context of the climate crisis and the impacts of that. And so if you have a look at map number one on the left, you can see the additional seabed stresses under a storm event. So this is considerable, many newtons per square meters indeed. And if you look at numbers two and three, the tidal range and the sea level rise, you can see that despite the sea level rise, the coupling of the water column energy with the bed can be enhanced. And that is likely because of the tidal range changing in certain areas. Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive, and this is something that we will investigate further. And the reason why we want to investigate that further is one of our key outputs will be the, the future of the seabed sediments. How will certain sediment fractions be mobilized and how sensitive will, for instance, the seabirds be to that? Because we know that the seabirds will feed on sand deals and that sand deals will be very sensitive to changes um, to the, the seabed sediments. And so on the left hand side, map number one, you see how much the seabed shear stress at the moment today is higher than what is needed to mobilize the sand. And that leads to the map in number two in the middle. That's the percentage of sand moving today. And of course, one of the key outputs is an example in number three. The map there is showing you the difference between the mobilization of sand in 2050 uh, compared to today. And in this case, it seems that quite a bit less sand will be mobilized. And that brings us, of course, to the behavior of that prey fish. And that's the second research highlight as well. What we've done really well in our first observational campaign in June 2023 it was, was to look at all those factors that you see on the right hand side in those blue boxes. We co-registered everything about the habitat, everything about the prey and everything about the seabirds. And that's no mean feat. These are the Mersal trolls, at sea seabird observations, fish school distribution observations, diet samples, fecal samples, nest monitoring, chick ringing, video biologgers and all that at the same time. But what that has shown us is that it's not just the location, but the behavior of the prey fish that matters. And of course, our next step then is how does that then link to the bed properties? Because that is something that we can then predict. And so we can actually see where that relationship is going. Yeah. And that's the whole idea. If we link that fine scale relationship with all those observations that we have at UK scale and European scale, then we can start to estimate what it actually means what the consequences are of the seabed habitat changes on the foraging gains for seabirds. And I want to end this presentation by putting some questions out there, some challenges in the relevant policy context. What to consider regarding the benthic effects from offshore wind farm expansion? What is a healthy benthos and what metrics are we using to actually quantify that? How is the biodiversity net gain met and over what time scale? What is an effective and flexible approach for nature recovery? Do we look at ecological risk and consenting risk at the same time? And how might the decision making process need to change if we want to implement our research outputs? Really, really looking forward to discuss all these. Thank you for the opportunity to present Barry, one of the four projects funded under the recent EcoWind programme. My name is Martin Solon and together with Chrissy and Mazak, uh, we are the lead PIs for this particular consortium. So Barry has a focus on the benthos and brings together experts in physics, engineering, ocean science, invertebrate and fish ecophysiology and ecology, uh, marine technology and computational modelling, as well as socio-economics. Um, Barry also has partnerships with the offshore sector and industry and Public Policy Southampton, which is a brokerage for industry and policy impact. A third strand is Aura, which is a collaboration between industry and academia led by Hull with uh, over 70 postdocs and about 75 PhDs. So we're working together to deliver uh, this programme. I'm just going to explain we've got four models within this program. Our first module explicitly recognises that benthic invertebrate and fish communities and hence ecosystem functioning are dynamic and respond to multiple layers of constraints. So far we have around 200 high resolution data layers for the full um, UK EEZ 
And those are layers um, relating to the Met Ocean, to geoscience, to ecology, and also importantly, anthropogenic layers. Within these data, we can explore how species interact with their environment and with one another according to various short and long-term contexts, so things like seasons, climate change, and offshore wind cycles. With various field campaigns using autonomous vehicles, we're filling in any gaps in that information. And we are also combining all available information from the entire UK shelf about species distributions and environmental correlates to train machine learning algorithms to provide a complete picture of the dynamics of the system. That way we can inform the programme based on how the system works, um, both within and outside offshore wind environments. It's essential to underpin observations though with un unambiguous mechanistic evidence obtained in the absence of confounding variables. Um, across our consortium we have dedicated facilities in place so we can explicitly test um, uh, relevant levels of, of noise, of vibration, of electromagnetic, field, electromagnetic fields, um, thermal dissipation primarily from cables and we can also manipulate all of these within the context of climate change, fishing and other uses. We are assessing behavioural and physiological responses of species and any associated effects on ecosystem functioning for all of these pressures in combinations representative of different offshore wind life cycle operations. We are also using species that are functionally important and linked to other existing and future eco-wind projects. So for example, we are using fish species that are important prey species for seals and birds to link to those um, other sister projects. In Module 3, an important aspect of our approach is that we explicitly recognise the conditional dependencies of cumulative pressures and that the effects of combinations of pressures will vary with biological and environmental context. Previous approaches, including many ecological models, are constrained by data availability and existed knowledge. For example, we may test the effect of a potential pressure on a species. However, this is not useful within the context of cumulative pressures and it is oversimplistic and certainly is not a sensible basis on which to make decisions. Instead, we are using uh, structural equation modelling and um, uh, Bayesian belief network approaches that are not constrained by existing or stated model structures. They allow us to use uh, different kinds of data, including emerging or anecdotal evidence or expert opinion, to fill in gaps of knowledge with the best available information that we have. This is, more, this is much more flexible, it's much more comprehensive and much more useful to a decision maker because both direct and indirect mechanisms can be identified within a, with an associated measure of certainty. Hence our approach adopts a broader consideration of the ecological consequences of offshore wind by defining impact pathways that describe the mechanisms by which offshore wind pressures affect biodiversity and ecosystems whilst accounting for the multiple environmental and human factors that subsequently influence these pathways. So in the previous three modules, uh, we've amassed a lot of information, but how do you use that information to make decisions? Well, we're kind of putting it all together in module four and our final module, um, and here we're developing and applying a novel integrated decision support system explicitly designed to guide policy makers dealing with offshore wind through particular policy contexts, whether that be environmental gain, promoting recovery, biodiversity or, or net zero targets. So the first step on the left hand side here is to assess how pressures change the provision of ecosystem services, all the things that we care about. Next, in the centre there, we assess the changes in ecosystem service provision in a biophysical and monetary terms through economic valuation methods and using information in ecosystem accounts. A key consideration here is how the costs and benefits are distributed. The third step on the right hand side then requires involvement of stakeholders in a, in a participatory process aimed at better understanding and negotiating any emergent trade-offs or other considerations. Decision makers can then assess who wins and who loses and in what context or for certain scenarios informing any subsequent decisions. Importantly though, this process also takes into account plural values including ethics and other motivations, not just monetary values. This allows the feasibility and sustainability of different management scenarios to be judged against the likelihood of that occurrence. 
whilst highlighting any trade-offs, both biophysical and socio-economic, or any other considerations. So hopefully that's kind of explained at least the structure of our programme. I'm happy to take any questions now, or please do contact me uh, via email. Um, you can see that below. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. My name is Francis Daunt and I'm going to talk about our project EcoWings. EcoWings stands for Ecosystem Change, Offshore Wind, Net Gain and Seabirds and is one of the grants funded under the NERC OEC EcoWind programme. The study area for EcoWings is the North Sea and the project is focused on three research questions. First, what are the cumulative impacts of offshore wind on seabirds in the wider ecosystem? Second, what strategic compensatory measures deliver net gain to seabirds and the ecosystem? And third, how do we incorporate sufficient headroom for climate change that is predicted to continue in future? To estimate cumulative impacts of offshore wind on birds, we have focused on understanding where birds obtain their food at sea and to establish where the wind farm footprints are located in intensively used areas. We have developed maps of prey predation by combining existing data on distribution at sea with energetic models. We have then overlaid existing and planned footprints and estimated the demographic consequences of a potential loss of prey as a result of displacement from these wind farms and are now investigating how much of their foraging habitat is currently protected in MPAs. Our next step is to build these results into a rapid CIA tool for the whole of the North Sea. EcoWings is also collecting new data. There is a striking lack of existing simultaneous high resolution data on fish and seabird distributions. These data are important because we expect that effects of offshore wind on seabirds is likely to operate at small spatial scales. And a key question is whether birds are directly displaced or that fish are displaced and birds are responding to those changes. We will conduct a series of surveys in 2024 and 2025 using USV and AUV uncrewed vessels to estimate prey density right through the water column and relate these to bird surveys from aeroplanes and other sources that are being conducted in the region at the same time funded by Fourth Tay wind farm developers. Using advanced statistical methods we can then estimate the effects of offshore wind on seabirds at the prey patch scale and then weave this new process-based understanding at regional scales in our CIA tool. Our second objective is to develop strategic compensatory measures. We are considering measures that act directly on the survival and productivity of seabirds, such as predator management, nest site creation, and bycatch, and those that act indirectly by benefiting prey populations, such as fisheries management and habitat restoration. Our work is considering compensatory measures for seabirds, but also the wider ecosystem. But for this talk, I will focus on seabirds. One of the significant challenges with compensatory measures is the lack of empirical evidence on their effectiveness. In situations such as this, expert opinion can be gathered in a formal process called expert elicitation, whereby experts provide estimates of effects with uncertainty and disparate views are captured and incorporated. We conducted an expert elicitation of a suite of compensatory measures and asked experts to rank them on potential effect effectiveness for each species and then estimate change in survival and productivity for the top ranked measures. Each expert provided mean and lower and upper limits on these estimates. They were translated into a statistical distribution shown here. We will build estimates of changes in demographic rates from expert elicitation and from empirical evidence into population models. We are tackling the question of incorporating sufficient climate headroom through a series of linked models on physics and biogeochemistry, on zooplankton abundance and on sand deal and sprat energy, energy budgets. Currently, we are using machine learning to obtain rapid results on effects of physical processes and productivity on zooplankton abundance, and will then be developing the mechanistic zooplankton model Coltrane to understand whether trends in North Sea zooplankton have been caused by climate change. The outputs will feed into investigation of changes in seabird population dynamics 
and the whole ecosystem through the model Strath E2E. This will ensure that we account for this shifting baseline, and central to this will be how mul multiple measures can be combined in delivering strategic compensation that offsets offshore wind cumulative impacts at large scales, and what impact these measures will have on other sectors, in particular fisheries. Finally, EcoWings will be considering net gain alongside compensatory measures. There are multiple initiatives underway in delivering marine net gain. Opportunities come from passive restoration or active creation, and the focus is at the scale of protected species to whole ecosystems. Different metrics of species abundance, biodiversity and natural capital are being proposed, but monitoring effectiveness is a considerable challenge. We are interested in contributing conceptual ecological understanding and underpinning evidence to deliver effective net gain. We also need to understand the policy landscape that includes compensatory measures beyond no net loss and other policy areas, including fisheries management and marine enhancement. One important example of this is policy on sandhill fisheries. With last week's announcement that sandhill fishing is going to be banned in England and Scotland, we are keen to contribute underpinning evidence on the effectiveness of sandhill fishery closures on seabirds. To do so, we have investigated the effectiveness of the closed area for sandhill fisheries off the Scottish East Coast, which has been in place since the year 2000. We compared breeding success during the period the fishery was operating at colonies in that region with a controlled set of colonies outside the re region before, during and after the fishery took place, shown in this plot. In the Kitty Wake, we found that breeding success was lower when the fishery was operating at colonies overlapping the fishery, shown in black in the middle period, but not in the control area shown in orange. However, after the fishery closed, closed, there was only a partial recovery in breeding success, suggesting that there is an environmental deterioration that limits effectiveness of the closure. These analyses are ongoing and we're keen to understand whether they are just relevant to recent announcements on sandhill fishery policies or whether closure may also play a role in other policy areas, including compensatory measures and marine net gain. We look forward to discussing these topics with you all. I thank you very much for listening and leave you with these contact details.